Hi everybody, Kendall the beekeeper here from Sager Family Farm. And today we're gonna to be kicking off our Save the Bees project. Uh, so we're gonna be discussing the importance of honeybees and a few of the reasons why they might be in a bit of trouble. Um, so before I get started on our main topic, I just wanted to overview the interface over here. If you have questions for me, there is a chat window over here. Only I can see what you type. So if you have questions, you can type them over here. I might not get to them during the presentation, so I'll try to answer them all at the end because it's hard to read and speak at the same time. Um, I'll also be asking you some questions and you can type answers over here or if I have a multiple choice question, it'll pop up down here. So I'll point out where you can answer questions that I ask you guys. Uh, and without further ado, let's get started with our Save the Bees project. Um, so I wanted to start off um, a little bit with why bees are so important. So I've got some pictures to show you guys here. So why are bees important? Um, so if you've got, um, let me move where I am so you can see the whole slide. So why are bees important? And this is something that you can answer over here is um, if you think of anything, what do bees give us? Is there anything that you get specifically from bees? Um, so is there something in your kitchen that you might use? Maybe a cosmetic product, anything that you can think of, what do we get from bees? So, and there are a few questions on the side that while you're thinking of that answer, you can type in over here uh, if you have an answer to that. Um, a few people are asking me, is, is this live? It is, so I can definitely see all of your questions. There are about 80 students watching right now, so that is excellent, watching live with us today. So I am definitely gonna try and answer all of your questions, and I cannot see any of you. You guys can't see each other. You guys can only see me. So just to answer a few more questions that popped up in here. Um, and it looks like a few people are privately answering me. So you can type your questions over here, and even though you don't see each other's answers, I can see all of the answers. So it looks like, a few people are saying honey. So bees definitely make honey for us. Um, a lot of people are saying that we get food from bees. So some of the other food that's not honey we're getting from bees or fruits and veggies we might be getting from bees. And those are all totally correct. So let's go over here because we actually get nutrition, light, furniture, medicine, and uh, food, and even cosmetics from our bees. So we actually get a lot of different things. Uh, and I'll go into all of those. But let's look first about things directly from our beehive that we get. So the one in the very middle is honey. Uh, so honey uh, is the main thing that usually pops into people's heads when you think of bees. And obviously that is a food for us. Um, so it is delicious. I use it to sweeten my tea. You can eat it on pancakes. It is you can use honey in a whole lot of things. Um, additionally, it was used in some early medicines because of its antibacterial uh, properties. Honey has such a low water content that bacteria cannot thrive in it very much. Um, so we definitely have a lot of other medicines available now, but this was an all natural early form of an antibacterial. Uh, and let me draw a little bit on this so that we can uh, see some of these other things. So this one here, this one looks a lot like honey, but it's actually not honey. I like to think of this as the milk of the beehive. This is actually royal jelly. So royal jelly uh, is uh, actually oozed out of a gland in the bee's head and fed to little baby bees. So it is actually extremely nutritious. Uh, so just like a mama cow makes milk for her calves, the bees ooze out this royal jelly and feed it to the young babies. The queen bee also eats this exclusively. So she does not eat honey or pollen. She only eats royal jelly. And we can actually harvest this and eat this as humans. Um, so it's usually used um, kind of like a vitamin, so a nutritional supplement. So the next one 
on the far end over here, these like kind of little specks of dust looking things over here are actually balls of pollen. Uh, and we can use that as humans too. Uh, so we can actually put a special pollen trap on the beehive to knock pollen off the bees as they're coming into the hive. We don't leave it on for very long because bees need to collect pollen to live. But uh, humans can also consume this pollen. Uh, pollen is an excellent protein source for the bees. So we usually use this as a supplement. You can eat it in yogurt um, or in smoothies like I like to eat it. Um, so that is where we get pollen from. Over on this other side, we've got some beeswax, uh, which we can use in a lot of different things. So I've got like a little candle over here that I just made out of beeswax. Uh, we can also get uh, some soap. So I actually use soap and honey inside of my, uh, or I use uh, beeswax and honey inside of my soap. And then uh, I've even got lip balm. So I have some beeswax based lip balm. So which is really easy to make at home. Or if you've ever had like Burt's Bees, something like that, you can make lots of uh, lotions and other sort of cosmetic things. Uh, it can even be used to protect our furniture. So you can mix beeswax with a little bit of mineral oil and you can use this to polish wood and this helps it be water resistant so if you have a nice table and then you put a cold glass of water on it it can help uh, the water bead on top so you can wipe it off easily rather than absorbing into the wood and damaging furniture the last thing over here looks like this kind of almost like a caramel like this sticky goo and this is called propolis. So propolis is actually a botanical substance that the bees collect. Uh, so from like tree resin, so sort of like a tree sap. And the bees collect that and use it to seal tiny little cracks and crevices in their beehive. Uh, so when it cools down, it is very hard. But when it's warm, like inside the beehive, it's very sticky and gooey. Uh, and beekeepers can actually harvest this because the other reason why bees put this in their beehive it is that it is a natural antimicrobial. So humans can actually collect this and it was used as an early form of maybe like Neosporin. So uh, it can be used in, in antibacterial sprays, uh, even kind of a thro sore throat spray, you can spray it in. So that's what propolis was originally used for. It's also really beautiful when you dissolve it in clear varnish. So you can actually use it to stain wood. Uh, so historically, Stradivarius violins were stained with propolis varnish, giving them this beautiful deep red brown color. Uh, so these are products directly from the hive that we can use in our own day to day life. But uh, I think a lot of you guys mentioned that we get a lot of other foods from bees and we get that through pollination. So the bees are actually contributing to our food supply. One out of every three bites of food that we eat comes from the bees. Uh, so they are pollinating and creating more food for, for us. And that is actually by them taking pollen and depositing it at different flowers. And they are not doing this on purpose. They're actually doing it on accident. They're going from flower to flower to collect food for themselves. And as they do that, they're kind of messy and pollen gets all over them and they move it from flower to flower. And this helps the plants reproduce. Uh, so an apple tree that doesn't have any bees visit it likely will not have any apples produced. So the flowers will bloom but then they'll fall to the ground because they weren't, won't turn into fruits. If a few bees visit the apple, the apples, there might not be as many apples on the tree, so maybe they didn't visit all the flowers, so some of the flowers will drop off. The uh, apples that are visited, so when it's a flower, if a few bees go to it, the apple might be smaller and have fewer seeds in it, so it's not as good for the plant because the plant can't make as many babies. If a lot of bees visit the apple, then the apples are gonna be huge and have lots of seeds in them. So pollination can have a huge effect on the food that we get to eat, so how many apples are produced, and how that plant reproduces. So if we take a look at maybe our grocery store, 
with bees and without bees. So if you look at the uh, picture on the left, with bees, we have a lot of different foods. So we have a lot of apples, we have a lot of berries, avocados, all these things. And then if we look at the picture without bees, it looks a lot emptier. So this is if we had no, like no bees visiting these and pollinating. Um, so a lot of our berries disappear, a lot of our apples disappear. I do notice that citrus is still around. So a lot of citrus plants are self-fruitful, meaning they do not need a pollinator to visit them. Um, other types of foods have other sorts of pollinators. So bees aren't the only pollinator around, but they're extremely important. Uh, so without them, we would have either less productive food or none of that food at all. Additionally, there's this sort of plant. And this one, I think a lot of us probably haven't seen this, but this is actually alfalfa. And bees are huge pollinators for alfalfa. And alfalfa is a huge food source for cows. And our cows produce beef and milk so that we can have dairy products, so we could have ice cream, cheese, things like that, or even just milk to drink, yogurt. Uh, and then we also have, I love cheeseburgers. So uh, a lot of that is actually indirectly impacted by the bees because the bees are producing food for cattle. So when we say one out of every three bites and you think, ah, I don't know, I don't eat that many vegetables or fruits, it's actually one out of every three bites of all food that you eat because the bees are impacting our other sources of food as well by creating food for our cattle. So let's take a look at honeybees first. So there are actually a lot of different kinds of bees out there. And if you haven't already, um, there, I have a separate video called Big Buzz About Bees. Um, I actually have it on a project page for our Save the Bees project page uh, on my website, and you can click on it. So it's a big buzz about bees class, really in-depth for honeybees. So I'm going to do a quick overview of honeybees, uh, but there is a whole other class, Big Buzz About Bees, to watch uh, a really in-depth bit about honeybees. So let's take a look um, at what the bees are collecting from flowers. So first of all, this little bee has her tongue out and it is sticking into um, a puddle of, this looks like nectar here. So right here, she's got her tongue out into this sticky liquid and her tongue is called a proboscis. So the proboscis is uh, her special tongue-like part. It's kind of like a straw and that helps her suck up nectar. And this bee might visit anywhere from 150 to 1,500 flowers before she returns home with a full honey stomach. So this bee has two stomachs, one that digests food just like ours, and the other stomach just holds honey, or in this case, nectar. So she's bringing the nectar home so that she can turn it into honey later. The other thing that bees are collecting from flowers is pollen. So we can see a nice yellow ball of pollen on this bee's back legs. And actually, if you look over her whole body, she's covered in these tiny little hairs. And when the bee visits the plant, she gets covered in pollen. And she uses special hairs on her front claws to comb the pollen out of her hair and pack it into that special ball on her back leg on one hair. There's actually one hair called a pollen basket. It's a really long hair and she wraps the pollen around so that she can bring it home. So it's kind of like cotton candy on a stick and that's how she's holding it. Uh, so accidentally, this bee, either when she's collecting nectar or when she's collecting pollen, if she doesn't comb all those little pollen grains out of her fur, then she will move it from plant to plant because she is visiting so many different flowers on that one trip. So this is how she's accidentally pollinating because this little honeybee actually wants to bring the pollen home so that she can eat it. So she's actually mixing it with nectar to turn it into a substance we call bee bread, which is what the young baby bees eat as they're growing up. 
So when the bees are coming home, we can see in one picture, we've got a tree branch uh, with this white honeycomb on it. And this is a wild beehive. So bees can live in the wild or they can live in boxes uh, like this one with a picture of me and one of my beehives. So they can live in boxes that are managed by beekeepers, um, but they can live easily in either scenario. Inside of that beehive, there are three different castes of bees. So there's worker bees, drone bees, and the queen bee. So going through each one of these, the queen bee, there's only one of her in the entire beehive. She can actually live for three to five years in that same beehive. And she only has one job. So she only does one thing in there. And a lot of people think, ah, this is the bee that's in charge of everybody. She bosses everybody around. But it's actually the other way around. The other bees tell her what to do. And she does this really well. She lays eggs. So we take a look here. All of these tiny little grains of rice looking things like those ones there right in the middle of the cell. Those are bee eggs. So the queen bee goes from cell to cell and puts her long abdomen inside and lays an egg at the bottom of each cell. She waits. She actually pokes her head in first and looks to make sure that it's empty. And she also smells to see if the other bees have coated the inside with propolis. So this natural antimicrobial, antibacterial uh, resin that they're collecting, they use that to make sure the cell is clean for the little baby to grow up in. So as soon as the baby comes out of that cell, they will recoat it and clean it so that it's nice and clean for the next baby so that the uh, future generations don't get sick. The queen bee, she is so good at laying eggs, she can actually lay 2,000 eggs every day. Uh, so she is laying a lot of eggs. This is why she only has one job. And she has to eat really nutritious food, so she's only eating royal jelly during this process. So looking at the little baby bees growing up, we can see some eggs on one side of the picture, but then we see these C-shaped larvae like this. So each one is a larva. So their life cycle is actually kind of close to a butterfly. They start out as an egg and then they're kind of this like caterpillar looking thing. Uh, and they're actually sitting in a milky white liquid. This is royal jelly. So when the larva are very young, they're fed royal jelly. And then depending on what they eat, it will actually turn them into a different cast. So if they're gonna be a worker bee, they start getting fed bee bread. If they're gonna become a queen, they only are fed royal jelly. So the food that they eat actually influences what cast they are. Next, the little larvae are capped inside of their cells. So as they're growing and growing and growing and eating, when they get big enough, the other worker bees will cover them and then they will go into the pupa phase. So they're going through metamorphosis inside of their cocoons, just like a butterfly does. So the caterpillar goes into a cocoon to then emerge as a full-size butterfly. These bees, so I call them baby bees, but it's really eggs, larva, pupa, and then they emerge as a full-size adult bee. Uh, so there aren't smaller bees inside of the beehive. They are all the exact same size. They emerge the same, the same size as their sisters. So the next cast of bee uh, that we'll take a look at are the worker bees. So the worker bees, these are the bees we see on flowers, collecting nectar, pollen, uh, and then coming back to the hive. Inside of the hive, they do all of the other chores. So they clean the beehive. They feed their little sisters. They guard the beehive. If it's too hot in the beehive, they fan their wings to cool it down. If it's too cold in the beehive, they cuddle together to keep warm. So the worker bees are called worker bees because they are doing so much work. Uh, so they do pretty much everything except for lay eggs. And then, and I'm also calling them she a lot. Every single worker bee is a girl. 
So that gives us a hint for the last cast of B because the queen is a girl, the workers are girls, and so the drones are the boys. So the drone only has one job and it has to do with how his body looks different. So if you look at his face, he has these huge eyes and uh, that is to help him see queen bees because his job is to fly around looking for queen bees to help them lay eggs. So the drone helps the queen lay eggs, the queen bee lays the eggs and the workers do every single other chore. So uh, I did mention at the beginning of this, we were looking at honeybees, but there are actually a lot of other kinds of bees. So I wanted to take a look at what is a bee? And I have a multiple choice question for you now, which I will put up there. So if you look in this corner over here, you should see a question, are these bees? So uh, you can answer yes or no, are they bees? So there's a lot of different types of bees out there. These ones all look a little bit like the same shape as a bee. Uh, they have kind of the same looking eyes, they're yellow and black, um, but they might be a little bit different. So I'm gonna leave the poll up so you can still answer while I go a little bit more into depth here. So over here, um, we've got a honeybee and a yellow jacket. So a yellow jacket was one of the things that we had up there. So the yellow jacket, is actually pretty different from a bee in terms of how it lives and what it eats. So if we look at these, they kind of look similar, but when we're looking very closely, if we look at the back legs of the yellow jacket, he doesn't have any pollen uh, on it, so he doesn't have a way to collect pollen. So sometimes this yellow jacket might not be a pollinator. Then also looking at the body shape, right here, the yellow jacket has kind of a skinny waist. So there's like a little gap there. And then over here, my honeybee is a little bit chubbier. She's also fuzzier. So there's a lot more hairs. There are some hairs on the yellow jacket, but typically they're a lot shinier and glossier. And the main difference between the yellow jacket and the honeybee, so my honeybee eats nectar and pollen and honey. The yellow jacket is an omnivore and even a scavenger. So this yellow jacket will eat anything, including honeybees. So they are actually, they're scavengers. So if I am having a sandwich at a picnic table and it's a ham sandwich, do you think a honeybee would eat it? Probably not because I'm not eating a pollen, nectar, honey sandwich. If it's a ham sandwich, the insect that's coming to bite it is probably a yellow jacket or a wasp because they're scavenging for food. So they might eat meat, uh, including my honeybees. So I actually don't like yellow jackets that much, even though they do have their place in the food system. So let me go back to my poll. And it looks like we were kind of 50-50 split on whether these were bees or not. And so going back to this, they're actually not bees. So they are pretty different, mostly based on what they're eating. So if we go back over here, so this is our honeybee. And here are some other types of bees that we might be able to see in our neighborhood. Um, so this one over here in the far corner, this shiny black looking bee, uh, they are pretty big and they're pretty loud when they fly around. So oftentimes this scares a lot of us when we see this bee, but it's actually a very nice friendly bee. This is a carpenter bee. Um, so they are named carpenter bees because they actually make their homes in wood instead of in a big beehive like the honeybees do. Over here, we have a little mason bee. So it's a nice like shiny blue color. So that's kind of strange. These bees look really different. Um, and that's because they all live in different um, sort of climates. They live in different areas, in different habitats. Um, so this little mason bee makes her home in a little tiny hole using mud. And then one that we might be more familiar with up here is the bumblebee. So we have lots of actually different kinds of species of bumblebees. So all in all, there are actually about 
1,600 different species of bee here in California alone. So I'm here in California right now. Um, so we have 1,600 different species of bee in California. And now I've actually got another question for you guys. So over here, I will ask you, are honeybees native to the United States? So did they originate in the United States or even North America? So all of these different bees, I said there's 1,600 in California. There's about 4,000 in the entire United States. And there's 20,000 different types of bees in the entire world. So there's definitely a lot of bees that live in other countries that we don't have here in the United States. Uh, and we actually have bees here in the United States that other countries might not have either because we all have different climates and different weather, uh, different habitats for the bees. So they're all adapted to live in different locations. So it looks like, again, we're pretty split on whether uh, honeybees are native to the United States or not. So did they originate in the United States? And the answer is actually no. Honeybees are not native to the United States. The honeybees that I keep in my yard actually originated in Europe. Uh, so throughout the United States, we keep the European honeybee. Um, so that would be Apis mellifera, but there are lots of different species of honeybee that live in different areas. So there's actually an Asian honeybee, um, Apis serrana. So there's lots of different honeybee species. Um, of the different bees, the honeybees are really the only ones that we can harvest honey from. Um, so I'll kind of break these ones into a bunch of different categories. So we've got the honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees. So I usually break them into three groups because honeybees are really social. So that means they live in a huge group. Um, so they live in groups of up to 60,000. So that is quite a lot. Bumblebees, they're also social, um, but they live in smaller colonies. So usually 20 to 200 bees in one colony. And then, uh, there are solitary bees. Actually, most of the bees that exist in the entire world are solitary, which means they live all by themselves. Uh, so just one single bee all by herself. So if we take, let's take a closer look at bumblebees. So how they live and why they're a little bit different than honeybees and why we need bumblebees. So bumblebees, this is what a bumblebee nest looks like. Usually bumblebees will find something like an old bird nest. So it's very common to find bumblebees in an old bird house that the birds haven't moved back in for the season yet. The bumblebee will come in and look at the bird nest and say, oh, this is a great place to live. And then they will create cocoons kind of like how uh, the honeybees do. So it looks similar, only it's kind of a little ball rather than this beautiful sheet of honeycomb that the bees make or that the honeybees make. So um, if we take a look in here, the bumblebees actually have a queen as well. So here, this big bee in the center, that is the bumblebee queen. And usually in the early spring, she lays uh, smaller little bumblebees, but the bumblebees, as she lays more eggs throughout the season and it gets into summer and fall, those bees actually get bigger. So at the end of the season, she is actually laying bees that are closer to her own size. So that's as she gets more workers. And the reason why bumblebees are really important is because there are some plants that honeybees cannot pollinate. And only bumblebees and larger species of bee, like the carpenter bee. The carpenter bee is a solitary bee, but they can do a very special form of pollination. And this is called buzz pollination. And this little uh, bumblebee here, she's actually sitting on a tomato blossom. Honeybees are incapable of pollinating tomatoes. So they have to be pollinated by uh, a type of bee that can perform buzz pollination. And I actually have a little video 
to show you what buzz pollination is. So let's take a look at that video now. But the bumblebee knows just what to do. It wraps its legs around the flower and bites down on the anthers, that male part of the flower. See those wings shaking? Normally, the bumblebee uses those powerful muscles to flap its wings. That's what makes the buzzing sound when they fly. But here, those muscles vibrate its whole body, so hard and fast that it makes a louder, higher-pitched buzz. This vibration shakes up the pollen trapped inside the anthers until it spews out all over the bumblebee. It's called buzz pollination, and you don't need a bumblebee to do it. A tuning fork will do. So that is buzz pollination. And it's called buzz pollination because uh, that bee, those vibrating wings, so they're vibrating very quickly to get the plant to release pollen. So for certain types of plants, like the violet in that video, or the tomato in this picture, the pollen is actually hidden inside the anthers. So most other plants just have the pollen sitting on the outside. So when the bees rub against the anther, they pick up all of that pollen and move it to the next plant. But these types of flowers have the pollen hidden inside and it needs that vibration to release it, which is why the tuning fork was actually able to release the pollen. Because when we hit the tuning fork, it vibrates ever so slightly. And if you put the tuning fork near the flower, the pollen will be released. So honeybees can't do this. So that's why bumblebees and carpenter bees and other bees that perform buzz pollination are really important because they are performing pollination on different plants. Uh, so lots of different species of bee are really important. One of the other cool things about bumblebees, so this is a bumblebee in a potted plant. So if we pull the potted plant out of its pot, it looks like right here, there's like a little hole that this bee dug and then is sleeping under the dirt. So the bumblebees do not produce honey. And the reason, well, they produce little amounts of honey, nothing harvestable for us. Um, so enough honey to get them through a rainy day. But in cold winter climates where there's lots of snow and there's no flowers during the winter, bees have nothing to eat. And if they didn't produce honey to eat for the winter like the honeybees do, so honeybees stay awake all winter eating honey. Bumblebees in the fall, they've created those larger and larger bumblebees and they've sent them out. And those are actually new queens for the next season. So the new queen bee will dig a hole and fall asleep. And then so she's hibernating. And then in the springtime, when it warms up and there's more flowers, the bumblebee will emerge and then go looking for a new nest site. So she'll be looking for maybe a new bird house to live in. And if she finds a suitable site, she will actually start laying eggs. So the queen uh, bumblebee actually starts out as a queen and a worker combined into one. So she has to lay eggs and then go collect food for her babies. And then once they grow up, and they become worker bees, she can stay home and raise more babies while they bring in the food. Um, so a queen bee, if we had a queen honey bee and just put her outside, she would die very quickly because she needs worker bees to survive. But the bumblebee queen can do the tasks of a worker as well as a queen. And they hibernate, whereas honey bees do not. So let's take a look at solitary bees. So solitary bees are, that's most of the bees in the entire world. So I've seen about like usually 75 to 80% of all bees in the entire world are solitary, meaning they live all by themselves. So these bees do not have a lot of time to make their own house. So a solitary bee house, if you've ever seen like a bee hotel where it's little tubes or holes in wood or pine cones, sticks, corks, even these are for solitary bees. So they look for a house that can fit them already 
uh, and then they start living there. They also use different materials from the environment. So this one is a little leaf cutter bee, and the leaf cutter bee cuts into leaves and she carries the pieces of leaves home so that she can make cocoons. So instead of using wax like a honeybee does, uh, these bees use a variety of different materials. So inside of those tubes, here are three different examples of different solitary bees. So up at the top, this one here, you can see all these leaves kind of wrapped into a little cylinder. These are the cocoons for leaf cutter bees. So they're rolling them and putting their babies inside. In the middle, this is a different type of solitary bee. And you can see the walls in between uh, each little baby in there, each little larva that's in there and eating. And so this type of solitary bee is collecting resin. So like a tree sap and using that for the cocoons. And then on the very bottom, this is for our mason bee. So down here, we can see the walls on either side are made from mud. So the uh, mason bee is collecting mud. And so these ones are usually an early spring bee when it's still really moist and they can find a lot of mud. So different solitary bees are around in different seasons based on what they can find to use for their house material. So inside of those little tubes, while they're growing up, the solitary bee, she is both a queen and a worker. So she's collecting nectar and pollen, and that's what this pasty looking stuff here is. That is bee bread. So it's the mixture of nectar and pollen, and she's laying little baby larva on top of it. So that little white thing is the larva, and it eats and it eats and it eats, and then it'll go into a cocoon and emerge out as a full-size bee. Um, so usually these bees hibernate in the pupa phase. So they hibernate in their cocoons. So the mother bee will go out, create all these little babies, usually only about 15 in her life, as opposed to the 2,000 per day of the honeybee queen. So she makes 15 bees in her whole life, and they will hibernate until the next season. So they'll stay in their cocoons and wait until the next spring season, and then they will emerge out. The other way that these bees are different, these solitary bees, is they typically have a different way for collecting pollen. So on here, we can see that this bee has a very furry stomach, and all of the pollen seems to be like glomming on there. And that's because many solitary bees have something called a scopa. And these are a special set of hairs for collecting pollen. So as opposed to the honeybee's pollen basket, so she's got one hair on her back leg, the scopa can be on the legs of solitary bees, or it could be on the tummy. It could even be on the front legs of the bee. So the scopa are in different locations. And as you might imagine, this bee with the very furry tummy, and she's collecting pollen there, she could actually potentially be a better pollinator because her pollen is all on her stomach and the honeybee actually wets pollen so that she gets a lot of it back to her house. So she's wetting it into that little ball of pollen, whereas this bee is collecting it dry. And so that very dusty pollen rubs off on other plants more easily. So native bees uh, that are only solitary can actually be better pollinators than honeybees. But honeybees are used to uh, pollinate farms because there's so many more honeybees than there are solitary bees. So there's just one little solitary bee and it's really hard to manage them because they're all individual as opposed to a honeybee hive that has 60,000 bees in it. So now I wanna get to the main part of our project. So we've seen bees are really important. They do a lot of pollination. They pollinate in a lot of different ways. Um, and we've got our three types of bees, but bees are actually in a lot of trouble. So honeybees are actually dying. We lose about 40% of all honeybee colonies in the United States every year. So that means if I have 10 hives this year, next year I might only have six. And while this means like I'm a beekeeper, so I'm managing my honeybee colonies, 
And so as opposed to them being nice and strong and healthy, I usually divide my hives so that I can get my number of hives back up. So the honeybees aren't disappearing anytime soon, but we're definitely struggling to keep the number of colonies up. Um, so because so many bees die every winter. And so I wanted to go through some of the reasons why bees might be dying. And so first, let's take a look at this picture. And I have another question for you guys. So over here, you can answer, is this a good place for bees to live? Yes or no? So and let's examine this a little bit. Of Would this be a good place for a bee to live? So it does look like there's water. And when I take a look at this picture, there's a lot of green in this picture. So off the bat, it kind of thinks like, hmm, this place doesn't look so bad. There's some houses over on the side there. So definitely a person might want to live near here. But um, and it looks like a lot of you are answering like, no, this doesn't look like a good place for bees to live. And when I look at what plants are growing there, I see a lot of grass. And that's something we can ask ourselves, do honeybees get nectar or pollen from grass? And the answer is no. So I actually, while I'm looking at this, and while it looks beautiful to me as a human, to a bee, this looks like a food desert. So there's not very much food or any kind of places for them to live around here. So this is actually an example of habitat loss. So as humans move in, and we start taking out wildflowers and open meadows and replacing it with things that are appealing to us, they may not be appealing for bees. Um, so this nice grassy area, maybe not the best. So this is the bees are losing places to live because there is no food to eat here. So the bees do not want to live here. So no, this is not a very good place for bees to live. So next, let's look at this. So these are actually rows of trees and they look white because they're actually all in bloom. And let me ask you the exact same question again is, is this a good place for bees to live? So this definitely looks more promising. There's some grass on the ground, um, but then there's all of these blooming trees and all of these trees are actually almonds. So and bees are really important to almonds without bees. Al almonds would not be made. So almonds are 100% reliant on honeybees to produce almonds. Uh, and I love the taste of almonds. Almonds are great. Um, so they are delicious. And it looks like we're kind of split on whether this is a good place for bees to live. Um, so it looks like a lot of us are actually saying, yeah, this would be a good place to live. And this is actually an example uh, of malnourished, uh, malnutrition. So because there's only one type of plant, the way that our agriculture system has shifted to grow plants to make it easier for us to grow plants, instead of having a farm that has a lot of different little plants. Um, so maybe I would grow tomatoes and carrots and eggplants and a whole bunch of different plants on my farm. Uh, what's more common now is enormous farms with one plant. So if we were to go, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. So if I was to drive south towards Los Angeles through Central California, there are a ton of almond orchards in there. And as far as the eye can see, only almonds. And here's the problem is for almonds, they bloom for about one month in the year. As soon as the almonds stop blooming, they are starting to produce their fruit. So they're starting to produce almonds, but then they're not blooming anymore. So there's no food for about 11 months out of the year. So only food for one month. So bees do not want to live here. Additionally, when bees are here, because since almonds are 100% reliant on honeybees, humans actually put bees there and then move them away. So we put the bees in the almond fields for that one month and then have to move them away because there's no more food. So for that one month, imagine, so if you were a honeybee, but, or if we're a human now, pick a human food and just one food, maybe your favorite food, but that's all you can eat for one month. So if I chose peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, eh, there's nothing wrong with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Peanut butter has some protein. Uh, 
jelly pretty good. So peanut butter jelly sandwich, that's not bad for one meal. But if I ate that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for one month, I would probably not feel so good because I'm not getting all of the different nutrition that I need. So I need to eat a lot of variety. So do the bees. The bees actually need a variety of food. So when they come away from the almond orchards, they're actually a little malnourished. So now let's take a look um, at stress. So I uh, mentioned that beekeepers will put bees in the almond orchards. It actually takes about two thirds of the honeybee colonies in the United States to pollinate California's almonds. So that means bees get trucked from all over the United States and plopped into the almond orchards so that they can pollinate there. Uh, and this is pretty stressful for the bees. So they are going from one climate. So maybe they're in Florida and they get trucked for days across the country and then plopped in California. Um, so this is a little jarring for the bees. They're in a different climate. They maybe lost some of their foraging bees in transit because they were on the truck for so long. They were trapped in their beehive for those days coming over here. And then they're put in a spot where they become malnourished because there's only one plant that they can eat. Um, so it's pretty stressful for these bees to be trucked all over the place. Then there's also pesticides, uh, which you might think we'll find more on a farm, but we can also find in the suburbs and in urban areas as we're growing our different plants at home. Um, so pesticides, they're not smart. They don't know like, oh, this is a bad bug and this is a good bug. They usually target all bugs. So if I was spraying an aphid uh, and killing an aphid, if I sprayed that on a bee, I would also be killing the bee. So if we misuse pesticides and spray them on blooming plants, that can kill bees. And actually scientists were trying to think about this. They're like, oh, what if we could design a pesticide that didn't hurt the bees, but killed the other little bugs that we didn't like? Uh, and they actually came up with a new type of pesticide called the neonicotinoid pesticide. And rather than spraying it all over the place, this is something that can be put into seeds. It can be applied in water and soaked up through the plant's roots. And then it's expressed. So the poison is expressed in all the different parts of the plant. So if this is a bug that's going to munch on leaves, there's a little bit of poison in the leaves. And as the bug munches it, then it dies. So then when the bee comes to get nectar, there's actually little trace amounts in the nectar. And we've done a lot of studies on adult bees that when they drink this, it doesn't seem to hurt them, but they come back and feed this nectar that has just a little bit of poison in it to their babies. And we haven't done long-term studies on that, but a lot of different countries have actually banned neonicotinoid pesticides because even though they were designed to help bees, we think that it's actually really hurting the bees. Uh, so the United States, we can actually still use neonicotinoid pesticides, but many countries in Europe have banned it where their bee crisis started a little bit earlier than ours. And then the next one, uh, that this one is actually uh, one of the reasons why I think that the bees are dying the most. So this is one that I feel like is most important to me is pest and disease. And the pest that we're looking at in this picture is called the Varroa mite. So a Varroa mite is um, a little parasite and it lives on top of the bee. So we can actually see it right here on top of the bee. So it's very small compared to the, the bee. And it lives on the bee. And this Varroa mite is really smart. Uh, when the bee is cleaning herself, the top of that Varroa mite actually feels like the honeybee herself. So it's camouflaged itself onto the bee's body. And the varroa mite bites the bee and can get it sick. And I actually have a video for us to watch. And just one second, I'm gonna clear some of my drawings, but I have a quick video about the varroa mite. Since varroa mites don't have any wings of their own, they slip into hives by hitching a ride on the backs of adult bees. And for the lucky mite, the trip includes an in-flight meal, as varroa mites will begin feeding on honeybees' fat body tissue within a few minutes of clinging to the bee. 
Once they've entered the hive, Varroa mites slip undetected into the vulnerable, uncapped brood cells. This is where the mites lay in wait until the bees cap the brood. Once a cell is capped, the mother mite, like a tiny spider, climbs atop the cocoon of the developing bee, tears open a hole, and begins to feed on its fat body tissue. Within three days, the mother mite lays her first egg, which always develops into a male. Then, she lays one female egg every 30 hours over the next week or so in her newly acquired home under the brood cap. And as each of these female mites mature, they mate with their brother. By the time the baby bee develops and leaves its infested cell, as many as three fertilized mites will emerge with it, and the cycle continues. Using this strategy, the Varroa mite population can grow as fast as the bee population it feeds on. But when summer ends and the bee population declines, the hive is left with a huge mite population, and that's dangerous. Too many mites in a hive will overwhelm and kill entire bee colonies. So what does that mean for everyone's favorite insect, the honeybee? Well, honeybee colonies with heavy mite infestations can't effectively pollinate or produce honey because they suffer from diseases and viruses transmitted by the mites. In fact, honeybees suffer from as many as 20 different mite-induced viruses, including the devastating deformed wing virus, which prevents them from flying. So this brings us to the project, is um, how can I help honeybees? So um, what I would love for you guys to do is count pollinator populations. So I did this the other day, um, just going on a walk in my neighborhood. So I walked around and I looked for blooming plants. So I just did a five minute walk and here I saw a plant with a bee on it. So I counted how many bees I saw in my neighborhood. So I'll put up a worksheet on how to do this um, later this weekend. Um, I do have some worksheets for us to work on about these presentations to check our understanding, but um, Counting pollinator populations can let us know how many bees are already in our community. And if we're doing research on how to help bees, if we implement solutions in our area, this could help us measure the results. So if you go on a walk this year versus next year after you've planted more blooming plants for honeybees, you might see more bees next year. Um, so this is a good long-term way to check how many bees are already in your community. So if it's safe to do so, if you can go into your own backyard or even look out a window uh, to right now, we've got a lot of cherry blossoms blooming in our area. So if you can look for bees in your community, that is a great way to assess how are bees doing in your neighborhood right now. And then let's look at the next one. So next, I'd love for you guys to research threats. So that's habitat loss, malnutrition, stress, pesticides, and disease. So maybe you can even pick a few or do a little bit of research on all of them to see which one interests you the most. Um, and try to implement solutions within your own community. So that could be uh, when school goes back in, that could be at your school. You could try to do it in your neighborhood, or you could even try to do it on a larger level, like in our state, uh, working with maybe even lawmakers to help ban pesticides or create more friendly beekeeping regulations. So there's a lot of different communities that we are a part of that you could try to affect. And then lastly, I'd love for you guys to find solutions in our neighborhood. So find those solutions after you have researched the threats. And now I'm going to go um, to our chat window and see if you've got some questions. So over here, if you have some questions for me, if you asked them long ago, um, I haven't been seeing the chat the whole time. But if you have questions, uh, ask them over here. So let me see. Um, and it looks like um, from reading some of the questions, so type your questions in here, but I'm gonna do a little quick wrap up on that mite presentation. Um, so I wanted to just say a few more things about mites. So after that mite video, um, I talked about why the mites are such a big deal uh, here in the United States. And the reason why the mites are a big problem in the United States is because our bees that we keep here are European. And that mite did not co-evolve with the European honeybee. The European honeybee is relatively unfamiliar with this mite. 
the mite originally lived on the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, so a different species of honeybee. And so that mite can actually live with the Asian honeybee quite well. But when we started moving things in between countries, I think the varroa mites started making their presence here in the United States in the 1980s. So they have been here for quite some time, but that's relatively short in the grand scheme of things of how long bees have existed. So the European honeybee doesn't know how to exist with the varroa mite, which is why the varroa mites are killing it. Because if you think of what a good parasite would do, a good parasite would keep its host alive and feed off of it for a long time. But our parasites might be killing the bees, which means they have to go find a new host. So they constantly have to be going to new hosts. So let's see. Let me answer a few questions and see. Um, are the bees dying called colony collapse disorder? Yes, so colony collapse disorder is a big thing that's out there. So we see that a lot. And what colony collapse disorder is, is it describes um, basically the bees just disappear. So eventually you look inside your hive and there's just a queen bee with a few different bees, but there isn't a pile of dead bees sitting out front of your beehive. So that's kind of strange. Uh, so colony collapse describes this very strange phenomenon where the bees seem to just disappear. Um, and that could be caused from a lot of different things. We actually don't know what causes that. But as we research the threats a little bit more, fewer beekeepers are putting their bee deaths into the category of colony collapse. A lot of us, what we think was colony collapse originally is actually the bees dying of disease from the varroa mites, because the varroa mites, this research is very new. So within the last three years, they've done a lot of research on varroa mites. Um, so 10 years ago, we had no idea even what the varroa mite was doing in the beehive. We thought it was drinking the bees' blood, but it actually eats the fat bodies. And we think the fat bodies have a lot to do with the bees' energy levels and the bees' immune system. So when it's eating the fat bodies, the reason why the bees might just disappear from our hive, and we don't know why, is because if they're eating the fat bodies when the foragers go out, they may not have enough energy to return to the beehives. They might just start disappearing. We're also getting better at seeing evidence of varroa mites in our hives. So we can see the feces of varroa mites. So when we're looking at this collapsed hive, if we see a lot of evidence, that the uh, varroa mites were there, we can say like, oh, maybe it was actually the varroa mites instead of this unexplained bee disappearance. Let's see. Oh, and someone is asking me, um, why do you see a whole group of bees flying in the sky sometimes? Uh, so this is a swarm of bees. So if they're all flying in the sky together, swarming is a natural thing that happens in the, uh, in the springtime usually, but it can happen throughout the summer and whenever conditions are good. This is how bees procreate. So inside of the beehive, uh, if the bees wanna make more honey beehives, the queen bee will actually leave with half the bees in the colony and go to uh, a new location. So they'll find a new hive. The bees remaining in the existing hive will raise a new queen. So the hive divided in half. These swarms, you'll see them transporting like themselves through the air. So this whole cloud of bees will be moving, but they have to take frequent rests because the queen is not a very good flyer. Uh, so that's why sometimes you see a ball of bees on a tree. Um, so that was um, why we see big ball like bees swarming in the air. Let's see. Um, and then I got a few questions on how we can help bees. And let me go over a few of the threats and why, maybe how we can think of ideas to help the bees. So I don't want to tell you exactly how we can help the bees because you guys have such great ideas on your own. So in terms of finding solutions for the bees, um, let's think about how we might kind of enact something. So if we were looking at, say, pesticides. Um, so the pesticides are hurting our bees. So obviously, maybe the best answer for that is stop using pesticides. But if you say, hey, stop using pesticides to everybody out there, a lot of people think, 
I have to use pesticides in order to produce my plants because there's so many bugs out there eating. Like if I'm growing lettuce, they might be eating all of those lettuce leaves. So in order to get any crops to sell, a lot of farmers think I have to use pesticides. So in thinking of our solutions, it's actually good to think of a good, better, best solution. So obviously the best solution is don't use pesticides. But in order to get more people to make a change, we should maybe have some different options that allows for people to try to make a step in the right direction. So maybe a good way to do this would be, please read the label of the pesticide bottle and make sure you're using it properly because most pesticide manufacturers do not want to kill bees. So they specifically say, do not spray them on blooming plants. So if you've got a pesticide and you spray it all over your lawn and there's a bunch of blooming dandelions or clovers in your lawn, then maybe you just killed a bunch of bees. But if we're making sure that people are using pesticides properly, then we're now reducing the number of bee deaths. Um, so that's a good solution is make sure you use pesticides correctly. A better solution would be maybe use more all natural uh, pesticides. So things that are let stick around in the environment for a smaller amount of time. So there's less likelihood of the pesticide being there on the plant. So neonicotinoid pesticides, which are actually in a lot of home pesticides, can stick around on that plant for up to six months. Whereas traditional pesticides usually dissipate a lot quicker. So maybe use a more all natural pesticide. And then the best solution would be to avoid pesticides and use something like a ladybug. So coming up with the good, better, best solution is a pretty accessible way to get more people moving towards helping the bees in our community. Let's see uh, if there are a few more questions and I'm just scrolling through because I can see all of your questions in a list. Let's see, um, why did the pesticide that was supposed to help the bees fail? Um, so the pesticide that was supposed to help the bees failed um, the reason why it was supposed to help the bees is because as a farmer, if I have a crop that is not blooming, I'm like, great, I can spray pesticide on my plants and it's not going to hurt bees. But if it was a slightly windy day and my neighbor's growing sunflowers, spraying a traditional pesticide, it might drift onto the sunflowers and kill all of the bees. So the reason why it was supposed to help bees is because we're not spraying it. We're maybe applying it in the water and the plant is soaking it up. The reason why it ended up hurting bees is because instead of just being in the leaves of the plant so that when the bugs munched on the leaves uh, and killed them, it also ends up being in pollen and nectar. And so the bees are still getting the pesticide. And even though they're getting it in a low dose as an adult, um, they're feeding that low dose pesticide to their babies. So that's why it ended up failing. Uh, even though we were trying to help the bees in the long run, it looks like it is probably not that great for the bees either. Let's see, and someone's asking me, why are bees black and yellow? And actually, if we were remembering back to that mason bee, that mason bee was kind of a bluish color. There's also these bright green bees. So bees actually come in more colors than black and yellow. So I don't know why honeybees are kind of this like yellowy black mixture, um, but bees do come in all different colors. So let's see. Oh, there's another one on how do the bees get their job? So inside of the hive, how does each bee get its job? And the answer is it actually changes jobs through its life. So for the first, the honeybees only live for six weeks if you're a worker bee. So six weeks only. Usually for the first three weeks of its life, it lives inside of the beehive. Uh, and then it do, does all of the inside chores. So its jobs actually start out closest to the babies and move further away. So the youngest bees actually take care of their little sisters. So they are feeding babies, sitting on top of the babies to keep them warm. As they get a little older, they move kind of towards the edges of the beehive. So they might start accepting food from the outside. So the returning forager bees, they might accept food from them and go put it away. They might be drying nectar to turn it into honey. They might be cleaning. So they might be bringing debris and bringing it to the outside 
or they might even start guarding the entrance of the beehive. So wasps and yellow jackets or even other bees don't get in if they don't belong there. So uh, then when they're older than three weeks, they typically start going outside. The very first time they go outside, they actually do this orientation flight. So they fly out, turn around and hover in front of the beehive. And when they hover um, outside of the beehive, they're memorizing what their house looks like. Then they start making circles to memorize further and further away. They can actually memorize up to five miles from their house. So they can make it pretty far. That would be a pretty long walk for me if I walked five miles from my house and back. Um, so these bees can go pretty far and that's when they're going to start bringing food back into the hive and the worker bees inside the hive will actually ask for different things. So if it's a really hot day and the bees need water in the beehive, more of the forager bees will start shifting to collect water. If they're raising lots of babies and they need lots of bee bread, more bees will start shifting to pollen. So the worker bees on the inside, as bees are returning, they're actually kind of dictating what those forager bees are collecting. So their jobs actually change throughout their lives based on how old they are and the needs of the beehive. So they aren't doing just one job their whole life. They shift jobs throughout their life. So let me scroll back up and see. Um, there's one question on when does pesticide wear off? And actually it depends on the pesticide. So that is actually a really good research topic. If you wanted to look into um, pesticides and using them more responsibly or not at all, um, that would be a great thing to start to research as different pesticides, when do they wear off? And let's see, how do you know um, if it's a queen bee at first sight? And let me see if I can go back through my presentation quick enough to show the different bees. It might take me a while to click through. But the differences, and I actually have a really good worksheet uh, on my website that shows the differences between the different casts of bee. Um, so the queen bee has a very long abdomen. So if I'm looking at her next to a worker bee, the worker bee has a short abdomen and the queen bee has a long abdomen. And often she doesn't have as many stripes as the worker bees. So she might have a solid color abdomen. And that is the main way we can tell the difference between the queen bee and worker bees is her body actually looks different. And it's taking me forever to click back through my presentation. I have so many pictures, um, but I'm trying to bring up a picture of my queen bee so that we can take a look at that. And I think I'm almost there. Just a few more clicks. Let's see. And then I'll pop up my presentation so you can see it. I'm just clicking through it so that you guys don't have to look at all of my pictures in reverse. Ah, I finally got there. All right, hold on. Here we go. So here we're looking at the worker bee at the very top and the queen bee at the bottom. So you can see her very long abdomen. And there are also drones in there. So if you're thinking, oh, the queen is the largest bee, Drones are also pretty big, but if we look at his body, he's kind of big and chunky all over, and the queen bee is long and slender. Um, so, and additionally, that drone bee has huge eyes. So the queen bee uh, looks different because of her long abdomen. Let's see. All right. And I think I got most of the questions. If you still have questions, um, you can actually log into the replay of this video and type questions and it'll email it to me or you can email me through my website if you have more questions about bees. On my website, I have a landing page for the Save the Bees project. So the first step um, for this project is to go through some of the worksheets I have and it goes through um, a lot of the topics in this presentation. So we'll cover the differences between native bees and honeybees, so or bumblebees, solitary bees, and honeybees. We'll also go over um, the different threats. So we'll uh, identify and describe some of the threats. Uh, and we'll also go through the casts of bees. So you can describe how they're different and what their different jobs are. So um, if you have more questions, I'll answer them offline. So you can email me. 
um, through my website. And please take a look at those worksheets in the Save the Bees project. And I will be putting on more video, uh, more activities on my website soon as well. If you're working with your school, they will uh, give you some activities. But for my folks watching at home, I will also make some activities for you. Thank you guys so much for tuning in live. And let me know if you have any more questions via email. Bye.